Okay, uh, hello again. Today um, I'd like to read uh, uh, a chapter I wrote for this book, uh, Britain and Japan Biographical Portraits, Volume 4, edited by Hugh Cortazzi, so Hugh, um, and published when? Uh, 2002 by Japan Library, first published. Okay, so I'm going to read my chapter about Sato, chapter five, um, which is titled Sir Ernest Sato, 1843 to 1929 in Tokyo, 1895 to 1900. Uh, this is uh, also available uh, on my university's repository in uh, PDF format. I'll probably introduce that in the, um, uh, the details of the video. Uh, description of the video. Okay, here we go. Um, so Ernest Sato, 1843 to 1929, is generally regarded as the best qualified and most outstanding scholar of Japanese to have been appointed head of the British mission in, J in Japan. He would have liked to be the first British ambassador to Japan, but was transferred in 1900 to Peking, then regarded as a more important post than Tokyo, in succession to Sir Claude MacDonald, who needed a transfer following the Boxer Rebellion. In the event, Sir Claude became the first British ambassador to Japan when the legations were raised to the status of embassies following the conclusion of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance in 1902. Uh, well, the, the embassies uh, came about in 1905, actually, after the renewal of the Alliance, as, I, as far as I recall. The mission in Peking remained a legation throughout Sato's service there. Sadly, therefore, he never became an ambassador, although he became a privy councillor and was awarded the GCMG, uh, the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. The status of ambassador was more important at that time than it is these days when every mission is called an embassy, however unimportant the country involved. Brilliant, but seemingly aloof. The best way to arrive at an understanding of Sato is through his voluminous personal diaries and other papers kept in the public record office. This brief essay introduces the man and his chief concerns during the above period based mainly on his diaries. I shan't read the footnotes. Uh, there is a footnote here. Okay, Sato arrived back in London at the end of May 1895, following his brief posting as minister in Morocco, where he had been since September 1893. He was almost 52. He had received a telegram from the Foreign Secretary Lord Kimberley, 1826 to 1902, on the 2nd of May, offering him the legation at Tokyo, and another confirming the appointment on the 17th of May. This was the post for which Sato was the ideal candidate having spent almost 20 years in Japan, September 1862 to December 1882, with only two home leaves, successively as student interpreter, interpreter, and Japanese secretary to the legation. Since leaving Japan in 1882, he had been British Consul General in Bangkok, where early in 1885, he had been promoted from the consular to the diplomatic service and made minister to Siam but he did not care for the climate or official corruption there. Bouts of malarial fever rendered him ineffective so that from June 1887 to October 1888, when he was offered his next post in Uruguay, he was on sick leave in England. Uruguay was an earthly paradise in which he found nothing to do. This is quoting uh, from him. Early in June 1893, he was transferred to Morocco where his task was to promote gradual internal reform through tact and patience. His success there led to his receiving the KCMG. Actually, an earthly paradise in which he found nothing to do, I think is not actually Sato, but one of his biographers. Yes, I found it. It's uh, Dr. Harold Templey's entry on Sato in the Dictionary of National Biography, 1922 to 1930, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1963. Okay, continuing. New Japan, the background. The Anglo-Japanese Treaty of Commerce and Navigation had been signed in London on the 16th of, Ju of July, 
1894, providing for the abolition of extraterritoriality with regard to British subjects with effect from the 17th of July, 1899, so five years later, and the immediate introduction of an ad valorem tariff. This revision of the first of the unequal treaties was an important turning point, both in Japanese history and in Britain's attitude towards Japan. The first Sino-Japanese war had been won by Japan, that was 1894 to 95, uh, leading to the Treaty of Shimonoseki signed on the 17th of April, 1895. But it had to be drastically modified after pressure in the form of friendly advice, so-called, that's in inverted commas, friendly advice, from Russia, France, and Germany, the so-called triple intervention, or sometimes Eastern Dreibund. Uh, Japan was thereby forced to give up the newly ceded territory of the Liaotung Peninsula in the southern tip of Manchuria, which included Port Arthur and Italian Wan, in exchange for an increased indemnity from China. Sato in England, May to June 1895. The permanent undersecretary, Sir Thomas Sanderson, briefed Sato at the Foreign Office. They discussed the compensation that Japan would receive for withdrawing from Liao Tsung. The apparent rejection of Japanese reforms in Korea and the Japanese annexation of Formosa where the Chinese seemed to be supplying arms secretly to the anti-Japanese guerrillas, the semi-savage Hakkas. Uh, that's H-A-K-K-A-S. Sanderson told Sato that he should leave as soon as possible for Japan. The Chargé d'Affaires, uh, Gerard A. Lauder, was doing, uh, Gerard A. Lauder was doing well enough, but without Japanese skills, he was dependent on the legation interpreters, John H. Gubbins, who was then Japanese secretary and thus chief interpreter, and the second secretary, Ralph S. Paget. Sato also had meetings with Lord Kimberley, who described Japan as our natural ally as against Russia, and stated that he regarded China as both unreliable and useless. Britain should remain friendly to her, but not rely on her as a counterweight to Russia. Kimberley also remarked that he thought the English newspapers at Yokohama did a lot of harm to Anglo-Japanese relations. Japanese vanity should be humored and their goodwill cultivated. In an oblique reference to Sir Harry Parks, British minister in Japan, 1865 to 83, he added, it was no longer possible to treat them as, as semi-civilized and to bully them. They must be treated on a footing of equality. Uh, this is from Sato's diary. Following the change of government from Liverpool, liberal, sorry, liberal to a conservative uh, liberal unionist co coalition on, in June 1895, Lord Salisbury took over as both prime minister and foreign secretary. He was more skeptical about Japan's capability and reliability than Kimberley had been. When Sato wrote to him from Tokyo asking for instructions on the 15th of August, Salisbury in his reply of the 3rd of October, doubted whether the Japanese were capable of preventing Russia from obtaining an ice-free port on her Eastern seaboard, which she could take easily take by marching overland from Siberia. Um, Sato was told instead to concentrate on the promotion of trade in the face of German commercial rivalry. So that's the one letter from Salisbury in the Sato papers in the Japan correspondence, which I have uh, published. Before his departure from England for Japan, Sato was summoned to dinner at Windsor Castle on the 25th of June, 1895, where Queen Victoria invested him with the accolade of a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, KCMG. But apparently little was said. A more significant meeting took place on the 11th of August, 1897 at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight during Sato's leave from Japan to discuss the, to attend, sorry, to attend the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. After dinner, they privately discussed Siam and Japan. And this is from a quotation from Sato's diary. Then she said the Japanese prince, uh, that's Arisugawa in England for the Jubilee, was nice but not handsome, and I said Japanese thought him good looking. Japanese women, she thought, were not so either. I said that travelers coming to Japan were shocked to find the men so ugly. She asked if Japan were not a very difficult post. 
I replied that uh, fortunately, the three powers, that's Rus Russia, Germany, and France, had made it very easy, and that being able to talk Japanese was a great help. She was much surprised at this and asked if it were not a very difficult language. I said it was because one could not learn it by living, it, I said it was, because one could not learn it by living in a Japanese family, as one would do in Europe. Arrival in Tokyo. Sato left Liverpool on the 29th of June, 1895, arriving in Japan on the 28th of July via New York and Vancouver. The business community and the legation staff greeted him at Yokohama. The next day, he called on Sayonji Kimmochi, the acting foreign minister. On the 1st of August, he met Ito Hirobumi of Choshu, his old friend of Bakumatsu days, now prime minister. Sato congratulated him on Japan's beating China and discovered the conditions on which Japan would give up Liao Tsum. They also discussed Korea, Formosa, and treaty revision. All from Sato's diaries. Uh, on the 9th of August at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., uh, Sato had an audience with the emperor and empress at which his credentials were presented. He was fetched in an imperial horse-drawn carriage 20 minutes before. In the reception room, Sato followed the prescribed protocol, bowed three times, and read his speech in English. The emperor replied in Japanese, later translated thus. We are exceedingly gratified to think that a greater cordiality in the friendly relations existing between our respective countries will be facilitated by the fact of your many years residence in our country and by your thorough knowledge of our national affairs. Then Sato saw the Empress, who expressed pleasure at seeing him after so many years, echoed the Emperor's words on Anglo-Japanese friendship being enhanced, and referred to Sato as being a great scholar in Japanese things. Sato replied humbly before taking his leave. Main political issues. The main problem with China from American, British, and Japanese viewpoints was how to prevent her partition among the land-grabbing European powers and preserve the so-called open door to free trade. Sato wrote to Sir Nicholas O'Connor, uh, that's Connor with one N, O'Connor, then minister in Peking on 3rd of September, 1895, that he supposed Salisbury's view would be the same as Kimberley's, that China has shown she can never be of any use to us as an ally and agreed in a conversation with Admiral Buller later that month that China is hopeless in the matter of reform. Her government system was thoroughly rotten. So um, uh, the letter to Sir Nicholas O'Connor would be in the semi-official uh, letters, which I've published. Um, when Sato saw Ito on 26th of September, he was told that Japan had tried desperately to come to an agreement with China over a sound system of government for Korea, but she had refused to cooperate, leading to the Sino-Japanese War. Again, this is a diary entry. Sato himself told Count Inoue Kaoru of Choshu, 1836 to 1915, the former foreign minister, 1879 to 87, and minister to Korea, October 1894 to September 1895, on the 4th of October, that he thought Japan was a much better country than China to lead Korea's modern modernization. On the same day, Foreign Minister Count Okuma Shigenobu denied that Japan had tried to pick a quarrel with China. The Japanese had been anxious about the Chinese Navy with its powerful ships and foreign officers, but the Chinese army was poorly trained and led. Ito had told Sato that beating China had been easy. In 1899, two Chinese commissioners visited Japan. On the 27th of July, Sato mentioned them in a private letter to Salisbury commenting that they were unlikely to achieve anything significant. Japan does not wish to be tied to a corpse, he wrote, nor to undertake the defense of China against Russia. Her chief care is for the maintenance of her position in Korea, and nothing but a Russian attempt to swallow up the peninsula will, in my opinion, turn her aside from her present policy of lying low till her armaments are completed in 1903. Uh, and that is uh, from PRO 30 slash 33, 14 slash 11. Uh, it's the semi official letters of Sato from Japan and China, which I've published. After the commissioners left, 
Sato reported again to Salisbury on the 5th of October that the foreign minister Aoki Shuzo had talked to him in a very aggrieved tone about their behavior. Uh, and this will be from his diary. By the way in which they went on, they had made it impossible to have any serious negotiations with them. He added, of course, there had been no question of an alliance between Japan and China, that is, but only of a friendly understanding, which was frustrated by their conduct here. Korea. Korea had for centuries been a vassal of China within the Confucian hierarchy, and attempts by Japan to displace the latter were in general much resented in Korea and China. Korean hatred of the Japanese could also be traced back to the invasions by Toyotomi Hideyoshi in 1592 and 1597, and more recently to the unequal Treaty of Kanghua forced on Korea by Japan in 1876. When Sato saw Ito for the first time, that's Ito Hirobumi, for the first time, for the first time on 1st of August, he was asked if Britain had any interest in Korea. Discounting commercial considerations, Sato stated that like Japan, Britain wished to prevent Russian annexation. Sato asked Ito if Russia was planning to extend the Trans-Siberian Railway down to a port in Korea. Ito replied that they aimed at something much greater, he read a memo from the Russian minister stating that Russia expected Japan to conform her acts to her declarations as to the independence of, independence of Korea. Ito and Sato agreed that neutralization of Korea guaranteed by several powers would be better than independence, which would allow Russia to deal directly with Korea and obtain her aims more easily. On the 25th of August, Sato reported to Salisbury that Viscount Mura Goro had been appointed Japanese minister in Korea. Uh, Sato believed he was a moderate in favor of gradual reform, but events soon proved him wrong. Uh, see Donald Keane's biography of Emperor Meiji. On the 26th of September, Sato reported that Mura had refused a request by the Korean government for Japanese troops to subdue an armed rebellion. It was Sato's view that Korea was quite incapable of reform from within. Ito himself believed that Korea could not survive as an independent state, but Japan could not prevent Russian annexation at this stage because her navy, though increasing in size, was still too weak. On the 8th of October, 1895, a coup d'etat occurred in Seoul. It was engineered by Mura Goro and the Korean Queen Min Bi was assassinated. As Sato discovered on the 14th of October, she had been beheaded. On the following day, Sato observed in a letter to his friend F.V. Dickens, Frederick Victor Dickens, that Korea would be another Morocco, a rotten fruit which no one may touch and which will be carefully propped up lest it should fall into someone's hands of whom the others would be jealous to the point of fighting. On the 13th of February, 1896, Sato received a visit from a Korean fugitive from Seoul where the king had taken refuge in the Russian legation. He appealed strongly for British help for Korea, um, but Sato was unable to assist. In May, he wrote to Salisbury that the Japanese viewed Korea as their Alsace-Lorraine. On the 4th of June, he told Kokugaku scholar, Viscount Fukuba Bise, that Inoue Kaoru had been in too great a hurry in trying to reform Korea along European lines. On the 18th of February, 1897, the new foreign minister, Okuma Shigenobu, suggested to Sato that Britain might establish a legation in Korea, but Sato replied, it would probably excite umbrage in the minds of the Russians if we suddenly, without any apparent reason, converted our consulate general into a legation. Again, that's from diaries of Sato. While on leave in England, Sato discussed Korea with Salisbury on the 6th of October. When Salisbury said the Russians wanted a port in Northeast Asia, Sato replied that a Korean report, Korean port would be of no use, but that Port Lazarev, that's Wonsan on the east coast of Korea, in Russian hands would cause great popular commotion in Japan. Again, on the 2nd of March, 1898, Sato received a well-known Korean exile, Pak Yong Hyo, who asked if Britain would take a more active role in Korea. Sato said that Britain had no direct interest there. Only Russia and Japan had, but the latter neither spoke nor acted. Koreans must be patient for a few years. 
On the 30th of March, 1899, Sato spoke with Aoki Shuzo, then foreign minister, who said, if Russia has Korea, Japan cannot sleep in peace. Unfortunately, the interests of England there are not sufficient to make it worth her while to support Japanese policy. But if Russia gets command of the peninsula, she will have a great and damaging position as regards commercial nations. I observed that Japan would not be ready for war till 1903. He replied that she might be obliged to act before. Sato and Aoki talked again on the 12th of October about Russian moves on Masampo, a coaling station and naval base for policing the Straits of Tsushima, which had been frustrated by Japanese land purchases. Actually, Masampo is on the south coast of Korea, not far from Tsushima. Sato saw Ito for the last time on the 2nd of May, 1900, before returning to England. When Sato observed that all seemed quiet in the Far East, Ito replied that no one could tell how long it would last. Sato answered, as to war, I said no one could suppose it was to the advantage of Japan to fight Russia, yet many people talked about it. Japan and Russia as to Korea, like England and France as to Siam, a pretty woman with two suitors, no need, however, to come to blows. One thing, however, seemed clear. Russia regarded Japan as the only obstacle to her designs in the Far East. Formosa, or Taiwan, as we call it now. Um, Formosa being a Portuguese word meaning beautiful, as in beautiful island. Kimberley told Sato on the 31st of May, 1895, that the government saw no reason for interfering about Formosa though of course would rather they, that is Japan, had not taken it. It was therefore not a political issue, but rather a commercial one for Sato, who had to preside over new consulates on the island as the Japan consular service was extended. Uh, and the China consular service was uh, sh uh, shrunk a little bit. In particular, he had to negotiate with the Japanese government over the camphor trade, Anglo-Chinese regulations of 1867 allowed foreigners to enter Formosa, buy and export camphor, but they were forbidden to manufacture it. In spite of this, five or six British and German firms were in fact allowed to do so. When the Japanese took over in October 1895, they tried to enforce the regulations. Several Chinese acting for the foreign firms were imprisoned. After protests by Sato and the German minister Gudschmidt, the camphor trade was conceded to foreign firms until the new treaties came into effect in 1899. Opium was another matter. On the 13th of September, 1895, Sato and Sionji discussed it. Sionji asked if it would be safe to take a permissive line to which Sato replied that the British Opium Commission had said it was less harmful than alcohol and that opium was frequently smoked outdoors by Chinese laborers though he disapproved of both. Issues in Japan, with a new treaty only just negotiated in 1895 and not yet in force, there were bound to be many issues which arose. The Yokohama branch of the China Association were against it. Uh, I'm sorry, it was 1894, wasn't it? Not 1895. The Yokohama branch of the China Association were against it as an undue sacrifice of British, i.e. their interests, as they told China, uh, Sato in a memorandum. They saw no benefit in further opening the country, unlike home-based British firms looking for new markets. Leases caused problems, especially in Kobe. The Japanese tried to put a time limit on perpetual leases and effectively prevent foreign ownership of land altogether. Sato discussed the issue with Foreign Minister Nishi Tokujiro on the 3rd of March, 1898. The governments and the personnel keep changing uh, in this period, uh, Japan's um, governments. Nishi thought there would be no objection. Sato replied that under the new treaties, foreigners would have the same rights as the law gave to Japanese and hence no need for fixing a limit. As to Kobe, I would wait till he got his information, but hoped he would eventually see that the governor ought not to have fixed a limit on his own account when the agreement between the Japanese government and the foreign ministers left everything to be arranged between the owner and the lessee. He added that only Ito and he understood the situation in Kobe as they had been present when the settlement was established. That was in 1868. 
Prison conditions and the access of consuls to arrested foreigners were discussed on numerous occasions, as were certificates of origin for imported goods, taxes on land and press laws. But the most sensational case was that of Mrs. Carew, C-A-R-E-W, accused of poisoning her husband with arsenic on Octo in October 1896. This was tried in the British consular court at Yokohama under the old extraterritorial system. Sato find a way of avoiding having Edith Carew hanged and accordingly, her sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. That was actually through an imperial pardon. Sato's personal life in Tokyo. Sato would have been pleased to return to Tokyo, not only for professional, but also personal reasons. It would give him the opportunity to spend time with his Japanese wife, Takeda Kane, whom he could not marry as a diplomat, and their two sons, Eitaro and Hisayoshi, also referred to as Hisakichi, and sometimes in the diaries as Cha-chan, an effective term used only in the Kanto region. Eitaro had been born in 1880, sorry, an affectionate term. Did I say effective term? Eitaro had been born in 1880 and Hisayoshi in 1883. They were therefore 15 and 12 years old respectively when Sato returned in 1895. Lightly coded references to Sato's Japanese family are interspersed throughout his diaries using other languages such as Italian, Latin, and Spanish. For example, on the 26th of March, 1898, Sato wrote, dined at Totsuka in Shinjuku ward near the present JR Takada, Takatano Baba station with tutti e tre, all of the three, in, um, that's Italian, yeah. The three here were Takeda Kane, Eitaro, and Hisayoshi. Another frequent entry is dined at Gembe, which is Totsuka, con los muchachos, muchachos, with the boys in Spanish. Yet there are usually few details given. An exception is 30th of December, 1895. This is a diary entry. Started at 10 with the boys for Shizura near Numazu, a brilliant day on foot and to the top of the pass by 11.20, reaching Karuizawa at 12.15. Uh, started again at 1.05 and walked to Hirai where we went rested half an hour and off again on foot at 2.55. Here Saburo, that's Sato's manservant, and Hisakichi took kuruma, that's um, um, rickshaw, I think, uh, anyway, a, a wheeled vehicle. While we continued on foot through Daiba and Yamashita, crossing a low pass just behind the visit village of Togo and getting into the main road at Yamakiwa, arrived at the Hoyokan in Shizura at 5.15, standing between Saigo's villa and the Kaihin Inn, a hospital. This is a new and elegant house. I gave a chadai, that's a tip or pourboire, of five yen, and we were well treated in consequence. There is a fine grove of pine trees on the sandy shore, and the position is a beautiful one. Temperature much warmer than Atami. There were also friends, foreign as well as Japanese, with whom to renew acquaintance. Professor Basil Hall Chamberlain, in Japan since 1873, was still there. And among diplomatic colleagues, Sato would have been pleased to find Albert Daniton, the Belgian minister, who had first been in Japan 1873 to 1875 with his English wife, E. Mary Haggard, sister of the novelist, Sir Henry Ryder Haggard, author of King Solomon's Mines and of the diplomat, Sir William Haggard. Other old Japan hands included J.H. Gubbins, who had taken over from Sato as English secretary to the Treaty Revision Conference in 1883. Henry W. Dennison, an American, had acted for the Japanese Foreign Office as a legal advisor for many years, and the Englishman William H. Stone had advised on telegraphy since 1872. Sato decided that he liked Lake Chuzenji near Nikko better than Hakone as a retreat from Tokyo, especially in the hot summer months. To F. V. Dickens on the 21st of August, 1895, he wrote, yesterday I came here, to a small house on the bank of the lake, which I have taken till the end of September. I forget whether you know the place, it is very small and quiet. The only other foreigners who have houses here are Goodschmidt, the Lowthers and the Kirkwoods and a German savant, name unknown. And on the 17th of September, he wrote in his diary that he rode 
which means boat in 12 minutes over to Tozawa, where my house is to be built. The villa which he had built is still used today by the British ambassador. Well, in fact, since this is written, um, it's been uh, handed over to Tochigi Prefecture, uh, which is now using it um, as a uh, tourist location. On the 30th of May, 1896, Sato went with architect Josiah Konda to the building site and decided where the boathouse would be. Later, he ordered a sculling boat for $70 from A Tech, that's T E C K, probably to replace a leaky boat. Um, Freiherr von Gutschmidt did not remain long as German minister between being the author of uh, several gaffes. The first was when he sent a telegram to Ito congratulating him on the Treaty of Shimonoseki, and then two days later joined in the protest about Liao Tsung. Liao Tsung. The second was when he wrote a foolish note to Sionji, and on 30th of December 1896, he was allegedly, he allegedly struck a student with his whip. He was replaced by Graf von Leiden. Asaina Kansui was employed as Sato's spy from the 2nd of December 1895 in the days before MI6. He was from a Hatamoto family and from 1864, sorry, and his father had been governor of Nagasaki. Asaina was also governor from 1864 to 66, though he did not serve there. In March 1867, he was appointed commissioner for foreign affairs and in January 1868, Commissioner for Financial Affairs. Thereafter, his career is unknown. Asaina appeared in the official dispatches as a confident source and gave Sato such materials as the shorthand notes of the financial committee of the lower house. Sometimes Sato asked for specific information. On the 12th of March, 1898, he told him to try and find out whether the Russians have informed the government of their decay uh, desire to lease Port Arthur and Talian One. Asaina was paid regularly, used usually in dollars or yen, but it is not clear how useful he was to Sato. And on the 19th of February, 1896, Sato thought Asaina was trying to pump him, get information from him. On the 11th of December, 1895, Sato was made president of the Asiatic Society of Japan, of which he had been a founder member in 1872 and to which he had frequently read papers in the 1870s. See my uh, paper on that subject, uh, which I've also uploaded as a video on YouTube. At one point on 30th of November, 1897, he discussed with Chamberlain a proposal for winding it up. That's the Asiatic Society of Japan because there were too many twaddly papers. Fortunately, it continues to this day. Sato lectured to the ASJ on the Jesuit Mission Press in Japan on the 28, 29th of March, 1899, and on 21st of June at the legation on the cultivation of bamboos in Japan. Sato retained a scholarly interest in other languages, including Greek and Latin. He read Virgil with Mrs. Kirkwood, wife of the legal advisor to the Japanese government, William M. Kirkwood, 1850 to 1926. He discussed Jesuit scholarship with the Catholic priest, Père Evra. He frequently attended concerts and amateur dramatics and was a keen member of a glee club, which he persuaded Mrs. Blakiston, widow of Captain Blakiston, to continue to play. Um, he played whist regularly and was chairman of the Nippon Race Club in Yokohama, receiving the major emperor at the races on the 29th of October, 1896. Other social engagements included dinners of Japanese Cambridge graduates on 24th January, 1896 and 12th of May, 1898, and another of British and Japanese barristers at the Metropole Hotel, Tsukiji, on the 4th of February, 1899, to commemorate the founding of the Anglo-Japanese Inns of Court Association on that day. We're coming to the end, farewell to Japan. On the 29th of March, 1900, a telegram from Lord Salisbury indicated that he wanted to send Sato to Peking and that Macdonald would not improbably take your place. Sato replied that he was greatly pleased at this mark of your lordship's confidence and accepted the transfer gladly, being better paid uh, £5,000 rather than £4,000 per annum, 
as well as being more prestigious. Several high-ranking Japanese regretted his departure, uh, including Ito and the Imperial Household Minister Tanaka Mitsuaki, to whom Sato said on the 3rd of May that he was the only faithful representative of the friendly feeling of England, and whether I came back, he was, sorry, he was only the faithful representative of the friendly feeling of England, whether I came back or not would make no difference. His final audience with the Emperor and Empress was on the 24th of April, and he sailed from Yokohama on the 4th of May. So that is this paper in uh, Britain and Japan Biographical Portraits. Okay, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>